Patangi ma'am, our esteemed guest lecturer. Our guest speaker for today, Dr. Purnima Nagaraja ma'am, the faculty of Department of Nutrition and dear students. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar program. I, Duraya Kaukar from PG Diploma Nutrition and Dietetics will be your host for today's session. The Department of Nutrition organizes a webinar on eating disorder in collaboration with Nestle by esteemed chief guest, Dr. Purnima Nagaraja ma'am. It gives me an immense pleasure to extend a warm welcome to you all on behalf of Department of Nutrition. First, let us know about National Eating Disorder Awareness Week, which starts from 27th February to 5th March. It's celebrated as National Eating Disorder Awareness Week, which highlights the seriousness of eating disorders across the world. The theme of NEDAW that is National Eating Disorder Awareness Week 2023 is C-A-R-E, CARE, which is continue the conversation, act early, strengthen recovery, and the cycle. During this week, OWH, Office of Women Health, encourages organizations, health professionals, and communities to increase awareness of disparities in the diagnosis and treatment of eating disorder. Share best practice for improving the quality of care and engage in conversation, healthy eating and body image. Through this guest lecture, we aim to disseminate knowledge about eating disorder. I'd like to begin this webinar by presenting our e-green greetings. Now I request Sabah Kulsum of Nutrition, PG Diploma Dietics to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Purnima Nagarajan Nam. Dr. Poonima Nagaraja is a psychiatric psychiatrist, a trainer, and a mentor. Dr. Poonima is a consultant psychiatrist at a wellness clinic named Driti Wellness Clinic. This clinic focuses on holistic uh, mental health, psychological support, personality development, counseling for adults, children, and adolescents, and rehabilitation for children with special needs. Dr. Poonima Nagaraja holds a diploma in psychiatry and a master's degree in counseling and psychotherapy and has been in practice since 1993. Dr. Poonima Nagaraja also collaborates with many voluntary organizations, the state of Telangana and the city police in training and offers resource to Bharosa, a center for women and child support. She has been a columnist with many newspapers and a TV host. She speaks many languages fluently. We are immensely grateful for having Dr. Punima as our guest lecture for guest speaker for today. And we all look forward for an enlightening lecture. Now I would like to request ma'am to take over the session. A very good morning to all of you. And thank you so much for having me here. Uh, I wish um, I had actually uh, come there you know, and stood in front of you because it's definitely a lot more fulfilling to stand and watch, you know, all the young faces um, and to be able to train you. But um, since it's a slightly busy time at the clinic, I was not able to make it. And that's why I'm here on this platform for you all. Uh, I hope the next time I'll be able to stand in front of you and we will have, you know, something like a workshop wherein everybody participates. Today also, I'm hoping that uh, people participate in the discussion, please post every question you have because eating disorders is like a rainbow. Uh, it's not just one thing, it's many, many things. And uh, the recent, most recent uh, uh, person who is now taking treatment uh, for eating disorders is the famous singer Celine Dion who sang uh, the most beautiful song on earth uh, in the movie Titanic. 
So um, she denied it for almost four to five years when people were noticing that she was losing weight and she's becoming extremely skinny. And uh, today she holds a diagnosis of anorexia nervosa and she's admitted in a hospital. Princess Diana had it. Um, a very famous singer of my generation, uh, Karen Carpenter, who has sung many, many beautiful songs, um, died from uh, uh, an eating disorder. She too had anorexia. So anorexia is more common than you think it is. And um, if we were to classify anorexia or um, any of the other eating disorders, it is what we call as a culture bound syndrome. That, you know, we today support a culture which talks of being extremely lean, having the perfect body, the perfect skin, the perfect appearance. And uh, this quest for uh, perfection is what leads to a lot of these eating disorders um, and a lot of other psychological illnesses. And as we say, all roads lead to Rome the same way most psychological conditions you know, lead to parenting and mostly maternal parenting. So it is also one of the psychological theories that says um, that once you... Um, are born, uh, particularly if you are a girl child, right from your childhood, your body shame for your shape, for your size, for your height, for your color, for your hair. And uh, the most classic thing that we hear in Indian households is that, um, you know, if you become fat, you won't get a husband. And that is there for childhood. So we actually propagate eating disorders. Some mothers are obsessed about size and shape. Some mothers are obsessed about healthy food. Uh, so a lot of um, the eating disorders that we display today uh, come from um, our parenting atmospheres and attitudes and cultural attitudes. Can we have the first slide, please? Um, is somebody there? Can we have the first slide, please? I'll keep talking in the meantime. So when I said culture-bound syndrome, uh, some cultures, for example, if you look during the Bonalu festival or during the Bhatkama Pandaga, there are people who get possessed by God. Uh, even in other religions, there are people who get possessed. And this is what we call as a dissociative disorder. And this is um, typical of the culture of our country. Uh, then we have uh, um, some uh, uh, diseases uh, or psychological conditions which are uh, seen in other countries, like for example, running amok is seen in uh, um, the Far Eastern countries. Um, hikimori is a condition where we, a person becomes extremely quiet and this is seen in Japan. Uh, so also, um, the eating disorders is a culture bond syndrome. It's hard to believe, but it is from the US. Uh, in, this, in, the, in the 60s and 70s, uh, there was a, a model called Twiggy, who was a natural size zero. And um, she became extremely famous um, and it's, it got many, many American women into total starvation and several of them died from the, and developed a lot of other issues like, you know, bone conditions, kidney conditions, because they were starving themselves to, you know, to become like Twiggy. Then later on, we had the Calvin Klein, the very famous Calvin Klein model um, called Kate Moss. She also was a, a natural size zero. And uh, um, a lot of people started uh, emulating her and went into starvation. Kate Moss later spoke about how much she struggled to maintain that size and how much she had, uh, um, how many mental health issues she developed because she lost the contract at, uh, at some point because she had gained a few pounds. The same thing is with uh, our gymnasts. You see, in India, we don't have... Um, too many gymnasts, now we are actually seeing them. But in foreign countries, particularly Russia, China, and uh, the US, you have gymnasts uh, and, and figure skaters who are actually contracted to be a particular weight. And if they, if they gain any more weight, uh, they lose the contract. So they are in extreme starvation. And then such people go into binge patterns where once in a while they'll just go and binge. When my daughter was very young, she was uh, uh, chosen to be one of the uh, you know, the little host that you have for um, the Miss India show, which is held in Hyderabad. 
and uh, that was when Neha Dhupia won the Miss India. So she was very, very small. And we were backstage helping our children because they had to wear costumes. And also they were alone. They were just buried. They were just five-year-olds. And um, I saw that everybody who was eliminated, you know, in the elimination rounds, would come out and just pick up food and start eating as if they've never seen food in their life. So I just picked up the courage to ask one of the contestants who had been eliminated. And I said, Peter, why are you eating so much? And she said, auntie, you don't know that for the past six months we've been starving, you know, and we have not had even one chocolate to eat. Uh, it is such extreme diet plans that we have been following that I just want to eat now. I don't care what happens if, even if I you know, gain weight and become very, very fat. I don't care. So see, extreme conditions, competitive conditions are also available where, you know, we are forced to be uh, of a particular size, of a particular shape. Um, even our film stars, you see, they're going on under the knife for uh, you know, plastic surgeries. They, you know, go on extreme diets. Um, a lot of them, uh, and also, of course, for uh, facial modifications and all that. Okay, but we'll not talk about that. That's you know out of the topic today. Um, so there are certain professions and certain uh, uh, fields that uh, demand this kind of uh, uh, shape and size, and and therefore, you know, it propagates uh, eating disorders. The pandemic has also given us, you know, uh, enough room for eating disorders. One thing is sitting at home doing nothing. So everybody was on a binge. And if all of you are on Facebook, you would, you would remember that for two whole years, people were uh, uh, sending uh, all kinds of uh, uh, recipes on, putting up recipes and pictures of food, uh, very, very exotic food on uh, Facebook as challenges. Because you know we're all sitting home and we don't know what to do. So uh, let's go for the second slide. Um, so then... Uh, uh, People also develop this thing for eating, you know, healthy food because uh, everybody wants to be healthy. We are so afraid that we will be afflicted with corona and uh, a new condition came forth and that was called orthorexia. Not with the pandemic a little before that, but no, no, not this slide, the one before that. The one before that, please. No, no, before, 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 down, down, down. Just after the tire. Yeah, that one. Yeah. So um, let me just get into this, uh, the topic right away. Uh, it is an actively essential for survival. You know, eating is something that we need. We take so much pleasure in eating. And that's why we hate diets. We hate restrictive diets. You tell a diabetic, ke aap mitha nahi khao, and immediately you feel so upset uh, because, you know, you're not allowed to eat sweet. You may not be even having a sweet tooth, but you will be upset that somebody stopped you from eating sweets. Uh, so we derive a lot of pleasure from eating. And that's why people... So because we love eating so much, you know, there's so many biological and there's so many social cultural aspects to eating. And um, we need to, you know, understand where we come from. See, there was a time when um, everybody used to enjoy their food. South Indians would love Italy, dosa, and North Indians used to love their parantas. And, you know, Hyderabad's famous crispy kima. And, uh, you know, the, the Greeks, the British, the, everybody had their own uh, classic breakfast, which everybody used to eat. But today, all of us eat Kellogg's, we eat uh, bread, uh, toast on uh, bread, and uh, we drink canned orange juice or canned juices. All of this is a culture which came from another country, wherein it was, you know, like fast food, even this concept of fast food, the faster the food, the less healthy the food is. So all of these concepts have contributed to the world's eating disorder. And it's not just restricted to you, me, or anybody else. And every one of us, you know, I speak for all the women here. Um, every one of us has been through a phase where we hated our bodies or we really wish that something could be done. There's not a single one of us, myself included, who has not been on some silly diet or the other, sometimes extremely restrictive diets, and then felt frustrated and started binging after that. So um, they're extremely common, okay? People always thought that the wealthy people have eating disorders, but that's really not true. Uh, anybody, it, it transcends any socioeconomic status and uh, about two to 5% of women uh, have uh, eating disorders. Um, basically, an eating disorder is characterized by a persistent disturbance of eating patterns that leads to poor physical and psychological health. Next slide, please. Yeah, so... <coughs> Causes, as I've already told you, one most famous and underrated cause is parenting. 
and maternal influences. So if the mother was say overweight um, or if the father is overweight, they will keep telling you, you know, don't become like us, eat less, eat less, eat less. I know one of my own cousins um, who was extremely obese um, told his own daughter, okay, you know, marriage is a month, don't be like me. And uh, the child developed an eating pattern at the age of eight. The whole house would smell because then she would hide food here and there and it would start rotting and stinking. So <coughs> some, most of the time, it's parental anxiety and faulty communication patterns that cause all these <coughs> eating disorders. So we have a bit of a cough. Okay. And uh, <coughs> see, there are some naturally genetic types where the build is broad, the shoulders may be broad, bones may be heavy, and you may not be the ideal weight. But uh, this also causes, can be one of the causes of an eating disorder. <coughs> so, next slide, please. <clears throat> so, eating disorders run in families, like I told you, usually woman to woman. The female preponderance for, uh, for um, eating disorders is much more than men. So for every, it's almost like a 10 to one. And, uh, but today I think the a proportion of uh, males going in for eating disorders is as bad. And we now have a third gender. So the LGBTQ also complain of eating disorders because particularly if they're transitioning from male to female, they would like to have a perfect body and they dream of a perfect body. So a lot of them go into uh, extremely severe uh, uh, dietary restrictions which um, they hope will give them the shape and, and in the body which they like. Um, so there's a lot of you know social culture that you know uh, is uh, prevalent here uh, as I have already told you and um, most of the people who have eating disorders feel inadequate, feel that they're not good looking, they want to make an impression in the world. They sometimes uh, it could be a part of peer pressure, it could be a part of uh, um, it could be a part of, you know, uh, a culture which propagates beauty. And if you look at you know, uh, any uh, magazine by Glamour, by Cosmopolitan, by any of these magazines, you know, and if you start tearing out all the ads, there will be no articles. Less than 5% of those magazines contain articles. And that is also about beauty and about diet. So if you actually look at uh, uh, the culture which is being propagated. The best to have the perfect body. In India, for a long time, you know, people always slightly plump a woman, you know, that was the idea of uh, feminine beauty to be a little plump, you know, uh, uh, so that um, about, um, she looks like the person who can bear children, and she looks like a person who eats well, khati siti and uh, uh, looks like a person who, who's capable of, you know, resilience. But today, even in our own country, we're looking at people who need to be, you know, extremely thin uh, as an idea of beauty. In fact, as you know, even Karina Kapoor went through that where she became a side zero and acted in a movie. And because she was, uh, I think, not quite accepted for, the, you know, for being so thin, she kind of regained a little bit of her weight. Um, the next one, please. Next slide, please. Uh, the next slide, please. Can we have the next slide, please? Um, if, you, if, you, if everyone could both mute their mics, it would be nice because there's a lot of background voice going on. Thank you. Um, so, eating disorders normally develop, you know, in pre-adolescence and early adolescence. So, when you see a young child, uh, particularly if you're all nutrition students, you will definitely receive a lot of, you know, clientele in the adolescent age. Um, most of them have obesity, obesity issues, autism, and um, they will, the parents will come there and say, okay, do something and make my daughter thin. And, you know, uh, the dieting uh, uh, schedule starts, uh, which most of these people, they fail at. In fact, another one cause of uh, um, eating disorder is PCOS. Uh, and obesity is a part of the syndrome where you have cysts on the ovaries, uh, you have uh, hair on the body, and uh, obesity. So, you know, well-meaning gynecologists will always say, better please lose weight. Uh, unless you lose weight, you're not going to be okay. And um, uh, please change when I tell you to change. No, um, It's either moving too fast or too slow. 
Yeah. So, um, where was I? Yeah. So, uh, the uh, well meaning doctors, physicians, and gynecologists will also say, but I lose weight. And that can even spark off a, um, a whole series of anxiety and insecurity, which leads to an eating disorder. The next one, please. Uh, a lot of these people hide their uh, um, food, hide their habit and hide the fact that they have an eating disorder for many, many years until there's an appreciable change in their body structure or in their uh, um, mental structure. And then let's seek help. By which time, you know, the habit is actually already set in. And uh, it becomes very difficult to cure. And I will not pretend that eating disorders are easy to cure. Um, so between the ages of 12 to 25, you have 95% of all the eating disorders, okay? Um, and if you're looking at people with anorexia, Okay, I'll go into descriptions later. 25 persons are male and 75 percent are female. But if you notice, 25 percent recently, uh, yes. this statistic has changed to 25. Previously, it was uh, 7.5 to 10 percent. The next one, please. Yes, thank you. Um, so the the um, eating disorders they come along with other psychiatric illnesses like anxiety, depression. Uh, you know, and a lot of them are doing drugs. Okay, so um, some of them are even on psychiatric medicine, which increase their weight. Or they're on medication, which is hi, ma'am, Duti, ma'am. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I'll, I'm just going to mute everyone for a minute, ma'am, and then you'll be able to unmute yourself, so that you know others don't get to speak. I have uh, not muted myself. I think it got yeah, muted from. I, I'm side. just going to mute it. I'm just letting you know. So yeah, 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 ma'am. Yeah, ma Ma'am, you should be able to unmute yourself now, ma'am. Yes, I've done it. Please. Thanks, ma'am. I'm sorry for the interruption. No problem at all. No problem. So a lot of uh, people with uh, anorexia or any of the other eating disorders, they have physical health issues and mental health issues. Um, some of them even can have serious heart complications, kidney complications, liver complications. And um, the, usually the cause of death is because of physical complications, which have happened because of either irregular eating or star starvation. Um, the next one, please. The next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so here are the major eating disorders. Uh, you might want to take a screenshot of this um, slide. Uh, anorexia nervosa, bulimia, binge eating disorder, avoidant or restrictive food intake disorder, pica and rumination disorder. And of course, like I mentioned, orthorexia. The next one, please. So anorexia is characterized by persistent restriction of food intake and the intense fear of gaining weight. So whenever they look into the mirror, they feel they're very fat, even though they're actually skin and bones and skeletons. Okay. Um, they usually have a, a body weight, which is very, very low for their age uh, or physical health. And um, they lose weight by excessive dieting, fasting, or excessive exercise. Okay. And they have what is known as a restricting type of uh, anorexia. Uh, could you please uh, go to the next slide? Yeah, so see how these people are. Bones are sticking out and, you know, this this lady here. Uh, so you can even see the joints and the bones and there's only skin and bones out there. And this is what anorexia looks like. And if you now Google a picture of Celine Dion in her latest, she looks exactly like this. The next one, please. So we have the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which... Uh, uh, characterizes anorexia as you know a refusal to maintain a body weight which is above a particular um, level which they think is right okay intense fear of gaining weight and disturbance in the way you look at yourself the way you view yourself is completely disturbed so even though people say look you're horribly skinny uh, they will say no 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 can't you see I'm fat okay so the next one please then you have what is called as bulimia Bulimia is an eating disorder where you have um, eating, like, you know, binging like, on, on a lot of food and then vomiting. So binging and purging, binging and purging. So um, a lot of them eat um, regular food or even junk food, but in large copious quantities. And then they would uh, start purging. Okay. Uh, many people feel that they're not able to control their eating and um, they may eat about 3,500 3, to even up to 20,000 calories. Uh, in about eight to 10 hours, okay? Uh, people with bulimia know they have a problem 
and they're afraid of their inability to stop eating. Whereas in anorexia, they don't know they have a problem. That's the difference. Next slide, please. So in this, you know, the, the cycle is like, you know, binge eating, then you have self-induced vomiting. Then again, you have binge eating and again, you have self-induced vomiting. And that becomes an extremely um, irrevocable uh, cycle. They try their best to stop or they try their best to, re to reduce food, but then they, whenever they reduce food, they feel very anxious. So you nutritionists, um, when you see a person who's binging, uh, it's too easy to say, uh, you know, khaya karo, or give them a diet which is restricting the food intake. Please remember that they cannot do it. And um, you should first start with uh, working on their uh, um, quantity of food and quality of food. Start with quality and then with, you know, so slowly start um, reducing quantity. So it's called the 10% rule, which I follow. So when I say you're eating, uh, say, a, a bowl of rice, remove 10% and put it in uh, another place where you can't reach it or put it away. And um, uh, if you're eating rotis, just take out you know, one little piece of roti and put it aside. And then slowly keep increasing it by 10%, 10% until you reach a level where you're able to eat without guilt and you don't have to vomit. The next one, please. Yeah, so a lot of people have depression and anxiety here because they're not able to control themselves. And a lot of people, you know, they do substance abuse in the form of, say, ganja, um, like, you know, it's called weed uh, or uh, any other drug which they feel might help them, you know, reduce their appetite. Such people even abuse prescription drugs for uh, appetite suppressing. They abuse prescription uh, drugs which are given to people to lose weight. Most of these people also abuse diuretics, that is, you know, urine producing tablets so that they feel they're going to lose weight. They also abuse uh, uh, laxatives, which cause motion, and they're constantly having loose motions because they feel that they lose weight. A classic bulimic will, you know, is will weigh herself before she drinks water and after she drinks water, before she eats after she eats, before she goes to the toilet and after she comes from uh, out of the toilet, so that you know they know. Oh, I lost five hundred grams uh, of water in you know when I went to. The, to the bathroom so now if i drink 250 ml of water that's more than enough and that is severely harming the kidney so you you understand the cycle right um most of these things start in the teens not even in the 20s it starts in the teens but until they are about 30 and in the childbearing age it goes undetected and a lot of the times it goes undetected uh, until of course people start looking for marriage proposals in our country it's marriage proposals the next one please <coughs> So uh, symptoms, like I told you, repeated binge eating. You can actually skip this slide. We've already done it. I'll go for the next slide now. So when you see, you'll always see, you know, the, the, the most important thing, you know, sign of bulimia is on the right hand or on the left side, you'll see a callus because they're they are doing this. I hope you can see my picture. They're doing this. So the tooth, you know, scratches. Uh, that is one sign. And the other one is chronic throat inflammation every time you see they'll have a sore throat and a cough because they're you know poking their throat to vomit okay um the other the other thing they will have is like you know uh, uh, a horse throat because they're continuously they're not able to talk because they're continuously you know um, traumatizing their throat okay um a lot of these uh being you know uh, unless you have bulimia the purging is usually not an option like for example for anorexia they don't purge they just go on these excessive fasts and excessive <clears throat> exercising binges, but the binge eating as such comes only with bulimia. The next one, please. <clears throat> and another thing that you should see is uh, a binge eater is usually obese, whereas an anorectic is usually very thin. The next one, please. So this is just a picture that represents bulimia. Um, so binge eating disorders. Um, is a little different from um, bulimia because uh, in binge eating, you don't vomit, you just eat, okay? Eating more than normal, then eating until you're uncomfortably full. And then um, even though you're not physically hungry, visually, when you see something, you feel like eating it. Or say, if you're leafing through a magazine and you see a, in a picture of a pastry or some biryani or something like that, even though you're not hungry, even though you just had your dinner, you will order it and eat it, okay? And then you feel disgusted with yourself. You feel anxious. You feel depressed. So this is binge eating. There's no purging here. If you if you see there, these people are also obese and quite large uh, for their height and uh, physical uh, structure. 
but they are not um, uh, vomiting. That's the only difference. The next one, please. <coughs> so binge eating happens in secrecy. For example, I know of a, a client who was quite obese and they were trying to get her married. And because she was uh, obese, they had put her on a diet, taken her to a dietitian, putting her in an exercise program. So what she would do is when everybody was sleeping at about 11 o'clock, she would go to the terrace, order um, a pizza from Swiggy or, and she would eat a whole nine inch pizza, even though she wasn't hungry. And she would throw the carton into the open plot next door. And nobody could understand why she was not losing weight and actually she was gaining weight. Um, then one day, I think uh, her, uh, her sister saw her and then you know they found out that she was doing this. And uh, she was also self-harming because she was so disgusted with herself. She was self-harming. She was uh, uh, banging her head against the wall. She was cutting herself. You know, so because of the pain of you know overeating and the pain of being in in a, a position where she can't control herself. The next one. <clears throat> Again, this condition begins in adolescence, um, and it can go on to adulthood. And this is a you know disease that can actually take you through life. Um, unfortunately, most curative methods and most uh, um, uh, Counseling methods fail here because this is about severe body image. And a lot of these people, unfortunately, have been sexually abused as children uh, or have faced some kind of bullying. They, uh, they might come from broken families. They might be having a parental, um, you know, interpersonal issues, lots of fights, lots of abuse. So they have brought, they've been brought up with abuse. And so they have very low self-esteem. And eating is like giving them pleasure. So, it's, you know, they translate as food is love. Okay, so for them, whenever they feel unloved, you know, food is the one that, you know, makes them feel a little love. Although they hate their bodies, they hate their, you know, habit, and, you know, they'll be always continuously uh, mm, facing feelings of disgust and anxiety. They will keep eating because that is, that is what makes them feel loved, you know, it gives them love. The next one, please. So at least, you know, if these people have been binging for uh, three months, um, we make a diagnosis. Um, Binge eating can also be a part of bulimia, but again, like I said, if you don't vomit, then it is not a bulimia, it is binge eating. Next one, please. So these are the health issues that we are, uh, that arises. One thing is obesity or extreme thinness, okay? Then you have medical conditions like diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, gallbladder disease, heart disease, cancers, um, arthritis, orthopedic problems like arthritis, knee problems, um, spinal cord issues. Um, also, along with that, you have, uh, uh, I haven't mentioned it here, sorry, but uh, PCOS, uh, which is very, very common, again, polycystic ovaries, and several other physical conditions that um, are associated with uh, eating disorders. The next one, please. So what do we do? You know, um, I think the time has come for us to work as teams, not individually. Like in my clinic, I cannot work individually and say, um, just do this and take these medicines because I would like to work, you know, with a dietitian to be able to motivate this person. Um, and a dietitian who does not inculcate uh, in even by mistake, I mean, I obviously you don't mean it, but by mistake, inculcate negative body image issues uh, to uh, the person involved, but gently encourage them and applaud every success so that they are able to slowly come down to a level wherein they are able to control themselves. It's about teaching them control. And uh, I think the greatest form of self-love is to be able to control yourself. The, Please, before that, uh, don't, don't change that slide. Can I just have the previous slide? Yeah, this one, thank you. So the things that we do is uh, cognitive behavior therapy. We have interpersonal psychotherapies, then some medication uh, because we treat um, uh, binge eating and other disorders as a depressive disorder. And sometimes uh, it may be associated with obsessive compulsive disorder with severe anxiety. So sometimes they do need uh, medication. Uh, then we have what is called as dialectic behavior therapy. And uh, mm, like I said, again, uh, support groups with nutritional counseling, psychiatric medication, and um, psychological counseling, student counseling, uh, counseling for parents. So the entire support system has to be revamped and redone. 
The next one, please. Thank you. So now you have what is called as the avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, ARFID. Okay, characterized by avoidance or restriction of food intake. So these are those chronic dieters, you know, not exactly anorexia to the extent that they are not, you know, all skin and bones, but they have a complete lack of interest in eating or food. They avoid uh, food and based on past experiences, uh, they will, uh, you know, they have their own uh, ideas of what food should be eaten and what food should not be eaten, which may be in complete contrast to what a nutritionist would uh, be able to advise. Mm. Sometimes they are even repulsed by the smell and the taste. For example, I know people who hate green colored food. So any kind of palak, bhaji, anything people hate it. Or if you're looking at a pesto sauce, anything green, um, even vegetables which are green, like all the beans, peas, you know, any of these things, they just hate the smell of green. Some people hate brown. So any gravy kind of a thing where, you know, it's Indian gravies are, you know, light brown to dark brown in shade. So they will hate that. Some people hate... Uh, um, the smell of mustard. Some people hate the smell of somph. So there are our methi. There are so many people who hate certain smells and this comes as an avoidant restrictive food disorder. They're, they're normally called picky eaters. You know, like ye nahi khayenge, wo nahi khayenge. And they typically develop in infancy, you know, in childhood where um, I know my own brother, he hates curds. He hates the, even the sight of the smell of curds. Uh, so uh, for my sister-in-law and the children to be able to eat curd, they have a separate fridge, you know, where they keep the curd which he doesn't touch. So, and they even eat at different time because in the minute he sees it, he starts, you know, retching and trying to vomit. So this is also what, what we call as a restrictive food disorder where he just hates the sight or the, um, the appearance of curd or even the thought of curds, okay? Um, a lot of people have, this may be there in people who have, are in the autism spectrum also because they have high sensitivity. You can have in a sensory processing disorder, then you have what is called as, uh, um, there are also people with OCD who have this thing, obsessive compulsive disorder, where they just don't like it. Some people, again, who have had restrictions of food in their childhood, it, either due to socioeconomic status or because of the family um, ideologies about what to eat and what not to eat. Um, I know my daughter's classmate, her mother used to always pack healthy food, rice and bhindi, and that which used to be brown rice. The first thing she used to come and throw it into the waste paper basket. Okay, and then she had to beg everybody else for their sandwiches and uh, for the other things. So these things happen, um, wherein a parent might have some healthy ideologies, but because it is in a very restrictive or in a very despotic and a very forced kind of way, children rebel and then they, the guilt of rebelling will make them just permanently hate certain foods. Oh, all my childhood I ate only bindi, so bloody I don't want bindi anymore. Thank, things like that. Okay, the next uh, slide, please. Okay, so this is just a representative picture. The next one, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. So um, a person with the, you know, restrictive food disorder may not eat food uh, that he ate previously or have a fear of choking or vomiting because you know, they, they hate it so much they will start retching. Okay. Uh, they reduce, refuse certain food uh, with a fear that will make them choke or vomit. And uh, they don't have an appetite for any known reason. All their tests will be normal. Every endoscopic test is normal, but they just don't have an appetite. Okay. And uh, they complain of having no appetite, um, but they will want to eat. And they're depressed because they don't have an appetite. They want to eat, but they can't eat. Or they want to eat certain things, something um, that, you know, somebody is eating. Uh, they just don't uh, think they can eat it because of the smell. Or they will ask, you know, does this have curd or does this have tomatoes? No, then I can't eat it. I'm sorry. Okay. Such people eat very, very slowly because they have to check and see. Like if you're eating, say, dal, which has mustard as tadka, then they will fish out every seed of mustard and then only they will eat it. So they're very slow eaters. Okay. Um, that's the reason why these people socially isolate themselves because they're told too slow. And also the people comment, hey, is me kya problem hai? Is me kya problem hai? Kyun nahi hai? So people have this uh, uh, fear. Uh, that's the reason why they don't eat with family or friends. They prefer to eat alone. They'll take the plate into their room. Okay. And if you even go back to pick up the plate, half the food will be right there. And they just say, sorry, I couldn't eat it. So even though say, really good food uh, for them. Um, what you will actually uh, experience is that um, 
they are not uh, able to eat and they will only have uh, issues wherein um, they keep refusing the food and they they have guilt and disgust for that and they feel ashamed of themselves so they socially isolate themselves and they have depression so such people even self harm sometimes next one please so here again i want to just tell you there's a difference between a uh, restrictive food eating and anorexia in anorexia they just completely stop eating restrictive food eating is very faddish and picky people you know they might eat something even though it's not good for health they feel it's good for health and they will eat it a very irrational uh, logic something that's good for health they may not eat it at all because they just start choking and vomiting whereas in anorexia progressively they just don't eat and until it reaches a time that even drinking a spoon of water becomes a problem okay the next one please so again you know uh, this is uh, quite a challenging thing because these patients are definitely thinner than normal they're not as thin as anorectics they're little thinner than normal um and they because they're constantly choking or vomiting or bringing out the food and this happens even in infancy you feed a child something they'll just spit it out and make a horrible face and spit it on the mother's hand okay so and this is not vomiting it's just spitting it out so um and that choking happens from a very very young age so parents also start you know getting worried and restricting certain foods even though they know it's healthy okay um and of course when they're adolescents and adults you know peer groups and the relationships friends family all of these things can become a problem because um people find them disgusting also they're sitting there you know first thing they're being very fussy and second thing whenever they see something or even somebody else eating at a different table in a restaurant they may start choking and retching so it becomes embarrassing for the parents also and becomes very disgusting for peer group so that's the reason why they uh, they also avoid uh, such people the next one please so uh, now we come to what is called as a rumination disorder okay um this is the you know uh, uh, an interesting capacity because birds do this a mother bird will eat all the food it will go into her gullet and into her stomach and where she will you know partially digest it and then she will regurgitate it into the baby bird's mouth so that is called rumination in birds whereas we also mimic the same thing whereas you know we will eat the food and then we will regurgitate it and it doesn't mean that you want to vomit just like in bulimia we vomit it out right use a finger and we vomit it but in this it's not like that at all it just automatically comes out okay they may say i'm feeling nauseous i'm feeling uh, sick i can't eat um and then they start retching and then initially it, it just comes out they start coughing and then it just comes up okay so then the food like you know they they um spit it out and um, sometimes they swallow it that's the reason why people find it very disgusting because when it comes out sometimes they reach it and swallow it so people watching say how disgusting is that because you're vomiting it out and you're you're swallowing it again but it's not vomiting it's barely not really coming it's just in the throat okay so uh, this is out of control of the individual and that again if you left leave it untreated none of these disorders get well so this is one where people find it disgusting in other things there may be minor irritation or there may be you know some anxiety and worry from parents friends and peers and doctors but here people are disgusted because you can't take them out in public so even the family avoids them and friends they avoid them because they are going retching everywhere the next one please next slide please yeah yeah so that's just the picture next one please next slide thank you so again uh, i have already told you this uh, they have abdominal pain or pressure they feel bloated and they feel that you know that retching is uh, making them feel better they don't chew their food properly so when it comes out it's always in a half digested form uh, most of these people suffer bad breath because it's always you know uh, bad uh, you know uh, food from the stomach contents and from the gullet it doesn't smell very nice um they have weight loss but they're uncomfortable with that weight loss a little thinner than normal and uh, Mm, they also always complain of gas or flatulence uh, and inability to pass motion because uh, you know the food doesn't really reach the red descent you know it's coming out before that next one please yeah so um 
we don't know the cause of this you know this is a little scary because it's not only about body image here we don't know how it how people are able to regurgitate it okay um unless you have a phobia for food in, in psychological terms you say this person is phobic towards uh, food or severe anxiety severe obsessive compulsive uh, disorder okay um all of these things they cause um, may cause i won't even say they cause because there are other eating disorders which are far more common than this one um but as a common symptoms anxiety depression obsessive compulsive disorder poor body image feelings of inferiority um which may or may not be followed with the substance abuse these are all common findings common psychiatric findings of course there are some people who have psychotic illness like say bipolar disorder or um, uh, as uh, um a part of a delusion they might say look i'm giving you prasad and they might regurgitate the food um or some people with schizophrenia may feel that you know there's some devil inside my stomach so i need to regurgitate but these are little rare most of these things are caused by anxiety depression and ocd uh, and psychotic illness associated with the um eating disorders is a little rare although it's not that it's never seen but we uh, we, we don't see it as often as we see it uh, in in these conditions the next one please so the other thing is the first thing you have to find out about um, whether that person has got a liver problem pancreas so everything gets checked you know the gastroenterologist is a one person that you need to first refer the patient to and then once you get a clean sheet from the gynecologist from the uh, there's no pcod from the gastroenterologist there is nothing wrong with the gut uh, from the ent there's nothing wrong with the throat uh, see how many people these people need to go to um and then you know we do again the same behavior therapy um anxiety reduction relaxation techniques um a change in body image and um, now we are also using uh, artificial intelligence and augmented reality uh, to be able to help so they wear those glasses and look at themselves as healthy then we also do mindfulness techniques and we try to manifest better health imagine themselves in better health imagine themselves eating whatever they want and being happy um you know dealing with their anxiety probably medicating them for anxiety and depression uh, or if they have ocd all of these things are uh, what we call as psychological interventions along with a lot of family support and friend support so when they have a best friend we say look don't be disgusted by the fact that this person is retching just take them to a restaurant or and you know, or take a separate room uh, you know the separate enclosures and order only what that person does not find disgusting all of you also kind of avoid and then slowly start ordering and encourage this person to eat one teaspoon half teaspoon um same way with family uh which i don't let this person isolate himself or herself uh, this is again commonly seen in girls uh make them sit with the family you know and tell her that you know to um first work on the sense of smell so do some pranayam do some deep breathing do some jacobson's uh, um relaxation techniques and then uh, work out the uh breathing part where you don't feel like retching okay then probably keep something in your mouth like a mint or something that stops the retching from coming in or smell mint see smell and taste are extremely uh, strong uh, impulses so if they're able to smell mint or peppermint or any smell which they like it could be a berry smell or it could be a particular perfume that they like you know if they're able to smell that to be able to drown the smell of others you keep smelling that and let others eat what they want around you so this is called erp you know you know the response prevention therapy uh, wherein they are exposed to the uh, offending uh, agent but they are we are preventing an extreme response from them okay mm, the next one please hmm so this is called pica now pica all of us have it you know particularly in films you might have seen that you know if a wife wants to show the husband that she's pregnant he'll start eating uh, you know one curry one raw mango and it's like oh is that right and then you know everybody is very happy so this is called pica when you have an unnatural taste for certain things it's called pica and uh, it's very commonly seen in pregnancy uh, where you feel like eating other sour things or bitter things or extremely sweet things okay we all have a little bit of pica in us like you know i'll be working one day and i think think and i wish i could eat you know some cake i just want it right now okay but thank thank god because there are patients there i don't get to do it uh, but we all have a little pica at one time children have it children who eat mud children who eat chalk all of these things are called pica okay um uh, stones in the rice soap paper uh, chewing on you know garment okay 
having you know chewing on paint okay um eating bad chalk of course some people have extremely perverted senses of eating the fecal matter drinking urine and all of these things um so these are all non nutritive things and people can actually get addicted so pica is all not only an eating disorder it's also an addictive disorder okay um they don't have any aversion to food they'll be eating normal food they'll be of normal weight everything is fine but they just feel they need to you know eat some of this and that becomes very addictive and uh, pica is actually very difficult to treat if it's not something that is self limiting like in pregnancy it can be extremely difficult to treat next one please <coughs> next one please so these are just pictures next one please <coughs> next slide yeah so um to make a diagnosis the person should be eating non nutritive food okay um any anybody below below the age of 2 or 3 even are not diagnosed because they have a tendency to put everything in their mouth so that's why you don't diagnose that but after the age of 3 the person is you know, seeking only one thing and eating just like you know handfuls of mud or screws or you know uh, uh, um, a particular kind of varnish paint biting chairs biting the balls eating chalk you know and continuously doing it that this is called pica most of these people have you know abdominal obstructions they might need surgery um they have severe constipation or they have diarrhea because they're eating mud worm infestations um appendicitis all of these things are very very common um again people with intellectual disability and people with autism spectrum intellectual disability these people are not diagnosed with pica because that, that is a behavior in abnormality and it is not uh, something that you're doing in you know fully conscious so this this has people again are fully conscious they will eat everything like as that and uh, mm, they have no other issue they don't have body issues and all that this is just like a habit that has gone wrong the next one please so most of these people i mean like i said you know uh, i have already mentioned this very very difficult to treat and uh, a lot of them uh, they go to physicians and they don't mention that this is the habit they have so the patients are also scratching their head continuously to find out what exactly is the issue and um, constant having bowel obstructions constantly having worm infestation constantly having having uh, um, abdominal uh, issues this is the sign that there is something terribly wrong with the eating next one please next slide please okay so um again like i said this is so difficult to treat you know physicians and pediatricians they go nuts actually trying to treat these people and uh, it's not easy even for mental health professionals to treat uh again counseling parents because their parents tend to become restrictive punitive they'll beat the child every time the child does something like this so all of these things you know are a big no no you don't beat the child and make them even more insecure uh, and uh, it develops into another eating disorder so you have to just gently you know try to keep those offending things away uh, supervise a child until you're sure that the child is off these things um use relaxation methods and you know anxiety uh, reducing methods because whenever you stop these things the child actually can have an acute panic attack or an acute anxiety attack um child or adult uh, although these are not non addicting substances that these people are uh, uh, addicted to um they behave actually just like drug addicts the stomach upset screaming shouting getting angry um so uh, it's a very odd uh, presentation pica has a very very odd presentation so, you know it, you will feel that this person is taking some you know high level uh, drugs or something but they're actually not doing that they're eating just some rubbish non nutritious uh, probably very unhealthy uh, food and they're hooked on to it the next one please so what do we do as a mental health professional and as dietitians so my request uh, and appeal to all dietitians is please you know let us form teams um i am doing this little course on uh, um diet uh, diet uh, dietary things restrictions and uh, uh, allowances in psychiatric illness but um that is not a part of your curriculum you know wherein you talk of uh, 
dietary restrictions. You know, do you know that we have lithium rich food for people with bipolar disorder? We have food which are, you know, generate happy chemicals uh, for people with depression. We have food restrictions uh, in autism, you know, that you must have heard of, of course, gluten, you know, um, and casein uh, restrictive diets. So there are so many diets which are so linked to mental health. And today we know that we have what is called as a brain and the gut brain. So we have a, a brain in the stomach also and the gastric um, flora and the mucosa, uh, if they are not uh, uh, in order, can actually cause diseases like um, uh, anxiety, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, autism, ADHD. All of these things are um, because of uh, these uh, issues. So taking care of the gut flora. So taking care of them with probiotics, prebiotics, um, you know, helping uh, with the gut flora. All of that is something that, you know, you wonderful people have learned to do and are able to do. So please work, uh, you know, in tandem with mental health professionals and psychologists. Um, teach us also because we also want to learn and learn from us about these disorders. Uh, most important is how you communicate, how you talk to these people, how you are able to convey a message without hurting them or increasing the, and how to find out you know, now that I've mentioned all these symptoms individually, although they are, they can actually be spoken about collectively, I've spoken about each of these things individually, so that you understand the symptoms. And if a patient like this comes to you, um, because of the stigma, they will go anywhere, but, you know, to a psychiatrist or a psychologist. So because of that, you have, um, um, uh, you have a big task ahead of you to be able to diagnose these people and also convince them that they need some mental health support and therapy and counseling and possibly even medication. So, you know, starting with the diet, you can slowly, gently, you know, turn them towards, uh, uh, you know, mental health professionals. And also the fact is that uh, being uh, knowledgeable yourself about mental health and uh, how it is so connected to eating and how uh, eat, not only eating disorders in, all of these that I have developed, you know, spoken about today, the people who are on antipsychotic medication, they gain tremendous amounts of weight. They develop, you know, um, hormonal issues because of that. There's period stop. And, um, you know, for a woman who has a mental illness but is taking medication with, which is making her gain weight, it can be so terrible. So she develops an eating disorder. So these are called what you call as secondary eating disorders. Because of a side effect of some medication, you're not eating. And because of a side effect of some medication, you're gaining weight. Um, people going in for bariatric surgeries. All of these people are people who have eating disorders and uh, are looking for a quick fix. Uh, but as you know, unfortunately, life does not come with a quick fix. Life is only something that we are able to um, measure you know, in small quantities, eat in moderation, live in moderation, okay? control our emotions in a moderation. And moderation is the key of life here. So once in a while, binging, once in a while, going out with friends and having a time of your life and eating, you know, all the food that are unhealthy, it's perfectly fine. So whenever, you know, parents come and complain, saying, oh, my daughter eats only you know, junk food, that is okay. It doesn't matter. They're welcome to eat junk food. It really doesn't matter. But as long as you people are able to um, also inculcate healthy habits and some body, uh, you know, consciousness without, you know, being abusive, uh, because most of us, you know, when we talk of body neutrality, uh, it is very abusive. Actually, body neutrality means that any shape and any size is acceptable. And, and you know, just like five fingers are not the same, um, uh, five people are not the same. So that is body neutrality. And we have to be able to propagate body neutrality through nutrition, through healthy habits, and through healthy thought process. So with this, I'll stop. Uh, thank you very much. And if you have any doubts, I'll be happy to answer them. Hello, ma'am. It was the session was really very informative. Although in uh, uh, yeah, adolescence, yeah, you uh, you know chapter, we definitely teach them about eating disorders, but not to this extent. Uh, but it was really informative, and I'm sure students are going to get benefited with the information that you have shared. Hello, ma'am. Am I audible? Not audible, ma'am. Am I audible, ma'am? No.
your voice is coming from a distance actually and i think there's a lag also hello ma'am now am i audible uh not very well ma'am but it doesn't matter i think i can hear you from a distance so in uh, these uh, all the student that have attended the session are from nutrition ma'am they are studying bsc and msc in uh, nutrition and dietetics so we do teach them about eating disorders you know in uh, adolescent chapter because under adolescent problems and uh, many of them actually have this but they don't you know come out so openly to discuss these issues and uh, and of course they have you know we do teach the concept of mindful eating also apart from imparting other aspects of nutrition we do uh, teach but it was really uh, great to hear from you because uh, we don't go in such deep and that too you are an expert in the field obviously so i'm sure students are going with a uh, good you know uh, information today with lot of information about binge eating eating disorders you know uh, all together so thank you so much ma'am for uh, accepting our uh, invite and uh, you know and sparing your precious time for conducting this uh, event we would really love to you know look forward for more such sessions from you you can always uh, you know let us know and, and and take a session you know in in yes, your college any i such promise you that session you want to have it you can ma'am please thank you so much ma'am thank you i request anoya to uh, propose vote of thanks let us see if there are any uh, you know queries from the students sure ma'am students you have any questions you can please post it in the chat box now it's actually the lunch time here ma'am so students you have to get no, this is this is too much information so they will not have too many doubts i think when we do a workshop for them then they will have doubts yes, this is too much information packed into them right now i just wanted to familiarize them with all the terms and the different uh, uh, types of eating disorders that you know uh, that exist and then maybe hopefully that over time uh, the questions will start coming so even if you know they ask you questions later i'll be happy to answer them only thank you so much ma'am I think you honored and privileged to get this opportunity to propose a word of thanks on this special occasion. Thank you. I would Thank I would you. like to start thanking the sister. Ma'am, am I audible to you? Not at all. Very 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 faint and from a distance. Huh? Very very faint. Your voice is very very from far away. Ma'am, am I audible? No. Hello, ma'am. No, it's still. 